Look at this, look at all this information. This is so noisy. How do we need all of this? This is not useful to us. Well, that's a lie, it is. This here, this is an audit log. This was generated using the policy on the Kubernetes documentation website. Now, whilst there's some useful stuff in here, I kind of feel like we can shrink this down. I feel like all of this can become this. And with that switch, fancy new green screen trick, I, you know, I can read this. I can see what's going on straight away. I know when something's changing my namespace now. I know when something's happened in an area I care about. So we can shrink this policy right down to something we need and something we can use today and then later add to and expand upon as we need it. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take a look at how we do that, taking it from this to this. Sorry, I had to play with the new green screen. It was, it's fancy effects. I mean, come on, give me a break. Audit logs are really important because it allows you to basically see what happened, when did it happen, on what did it happen, so what resource did it affect, who did this, what time did this happen, where did it come from, so like the IP address, things like that. You get a bunch of information in an audit log that is invaluable when it comes to troubleshooting something that's changed, something that's broken, you can see straight away what happened. Sometimes you're going to need some sort of log aggregator, I don't know, Elasticsearch or Loki or something like that to be able to read those logs, but having them available is vital for making sure that you can track what happened, when it happened, and all the things I just said. So let's get into making that work for our cluster now, and we'll explain a little bit more as we go along. I'm going to just say, can you like and subscribe if you don't already, because apparently it makes a difference if I ask you to do it rather than just leaving you to do it. Just really quickly click that button for me, that'd be great. I have all three control planes open here and I'm gonna make the changes on all three because it's highly available and we don't know which node it's gonna hit. So all three need to be managing the audit logs. So yeah, audit policy file on all three, all the flags being added to the Cube API server and that's what we're gonna do. But before we do, let's just quickly jump over to the docs so we can explain a few things. So in the docs, I've mentioned this in the intro, there's a few questions that an administrator will be able to answer based on the logs that come in. And then we have some stages to consider. So there are four stages of the audit trail, if you like, that you need to know about. The first one is request received. Now, all auditing begins its life in the API server, and when the API server receives the request, that's when this stage is triggered. So this happens before any of the other stages and before it gets handed down the chain. So the next stage in the chain is response started. Now, this happens when the metadata has been sent, but the body hasn't been sent yet. So, I don't know, say you submit in a manifest or something like that. As soon as the metadata is received, that's when this is triggered. The body hasn't been received yet, so that's where that stage happens. The next one is response complete. This happens when the body has been sent and there are no more bytes to be sent. So when it's received, everything. And the final stage is panic. And that happens when a panic occurs. That's, that's it. It is worth noting the audit logging feature itself increases the amount of memory used on the Cube API server and each stage increases that memory further still. So if you only have one stage running, then you're gonna see a slight increase. If you have all four, you're gonna see more of an increase. That's basically the rule. So it's worth noting that when you're going to configure auditing, just make sure your nodes can handle it. Obviously this is happening on your control plane nodes. You shouldn't have an awful lot running on there anyway, but if you have, for some reason, just bear in mind that this will affect it. Once we've decided which stages we are going to log for, we can start thinking about how we want to structure our policy file. So for example, we can omit a particular stage if we want to. So if we're not interested in the request receive stage, then we can just omit that altogether. It won't generate any audit events for that request. We can then start specifying which resources we want certain things to apply to, and then we have to consider the level that we want to log at. There are four levels, much like the four stages, that you can use when writing rules in a policy file. So when you write a policy file, you set up a bunch of rules and each one of them targets a level. Now, when I say level, what I mean is there's a level of information. That's probably the best way to look at it. So the first one is none. So that just means if anything matches this rule, throw it away. Don't even log anything, just get rid of it. Then there's metadata. Metadata being user that requested something, the timestamps, the verbs used, the resource, things like that. So if you do a create secret, you'll see that a secret was created and what that name was and who did it, but you won't see the content or the body of the request itself. If you wanna see that, then you can set it to be a level of request, which gives you the metadata and the request data, so the body of the request. And then finally, there's request response, which is the final level, and this logs basically everything. 
you'll get the metadata, you'll get the request body, and you'll get the response body. So they're the four levels that we're going to be using to write our policy file. We'll just start by taking a copy of this policy here. We're going to create our own policy and modify this over time, but we'll just grab this one as a starting point because you'll be able to see the noise, as I put it at the start, that comes out by default if you just use this one. So let's jump over to our terminal. And in here, we're going to create a new file in etc Kubernetes, and I'm going to call it audit policy yaml that can be called whatever you want as long as you map it into the right location and reference it via the flag on the api server it's fine so we'll drop in there paste that in and write it out next we'll take a copy of etc kubernetes manifest kube api server and i'll just drop that in my home directory for now because if anything goes wrong i need to be able to restore that finally we'll jump into that file the not the copied one the original one and we will start making some changes so i'll just put a new list item in and then double hyphen audit hyphen log I'm then going to yank that line and put a few in because I'm going to need a few different entries that start audit hyphen log. The first of which is going to be max age. Then we're going to have max backup. Then we're going to have max size. And then we're going to have a path. Okay, so what do each one of these do? Well, we have a path, which is going to be var log and then kubernetes and then audit forward slash audit dot log any audit logs that happen will go into that file next we're gonna have a max size which i'm gonna set to be 512 megabytes which means that when this file here hits 512 megabytes it will be rotated and if you've seen log rotation before you'll already know what this is if you haven't it just creates copies of the older logs and once it gets to a certain point it starts deleting the really old logs in this case i'm gonna keep 10 copies of those backups which means if I get 11 copies, the oldest one will be deleted. That is, of course, unless it hits the max age, which I'm going to set to be seven days. So if a log gets to be seven days old, it will get deleted. Otherwise, if there's more than 10, they will get deleted and it will always be the oldest ones. Finally, we need the policy file itself. So this is policy file and this is just the one we've created. So we will be mapping it to the same location and that will be audit policy.yaml there. OK, so let's spell policy right. So we have a max age of seven a max backup of 10, a max size of 12. We have a location to actually log the events to, and then the policy file that we have written. Now, this path here will be mounted from the host. This file here will be mounted from the host to this location in the container. It just so happens that I'm using the same location on the host and in the container. You don't have to. As long as you map the right source to the right destination, you'll be fine. So let's go all the way to the end of this file, just to make sure Tmox is still in sync. And then we will start adding some volumes and then volume mounts. So our volumes will Will be a host path and there will be a file and a directory or create however i'm not going to write this out because they already exist in the documentation so i might as well just go and grab them so if we scroll down a bit here's a little bit of information on the flags right here and then if we go down a little bit further we've got the volume mounts and the volumes well we need these volumes so let's grab that we will paste these in i'm just going to make sure we have a new line everywhere yep yeah, okay let's paste that in and it looks like i've got to do a little bit of formatting here so that's fine we can do that okay so that should be fine let's have a look we have a volume named audit which has a host path of the policy file we've just created and that is of type file we then have another volume of audit log and that has a host path of var log kubernetes audit which we haven't yet created but it will get created as part of this starting up all three nodes look good so let's go ahead and proceed to the volume mounts so here we'll drop a new line in again just checking all three yep that's good and then we'll grab this here and paste that in. We're just mounting host path locations to locations within the container. We've done volume mounts already before, so this should be a little bit familiar now. We just use persistent volume claims. In this case, we're just mounting a location on the actual host. That's the only difference. So these paths here need to match what we set in the flags. This is read-only true because we just need to be able to read this. We don't care about writing to it. This, however, is read-only false because we need to be able to write log files into this directory. Okay, that looks good. So I'm going to write that out and quit. And we should see that if I do watch, try CTL PS hyphen A, we should see some new API servers coming in. So we've got one here that's 17 minutes old, 17 minutes old, and 17 minutes old. We should see them get cancelled out in a second. Okay, then we have some API servers coming in now. So we've got one on here, which is 13 seconds old, and it's not being real attempted which is a good sign got one on here which is seven seconds old not being re-attempted good sign and 10 seconds old not being re-attempted good sign okay this this looks good so let's have a look in var log kubernetes audit we have an audit.log so all of that got created let's just tail that and we'll pipe it into jq because it is just json output so we shall read that 
And there we go, we've got a lot of logs coming out now. As you can see, they are just rolling by. So this is fine, it's good. You know, we can sit and read through this and see what's going on, but this is a lot of information, right? So what can we do here to clean this up? We, we can't have this being hammered like that. Now, if I was to create a secret, it'd be very hard to spot. We'd need a log aggregator. So what we can do is we can shrink this down. Let's go ahead and go to the policy file again. And in this policy file, I'm gonna start just clearing some bits up. So I'm gonna keep the request response for pod. I'm gonna keep the metadata for pod logs, but I'm gonna get rid of this. I don't want that and I don't want that and I don't want that because I'm going to do my own non section. I also don't want this, but I am going to take that namespaces line because that's going to be useful to me. So I'm going to yank that and put that down here. We'll edit that in just a second. I'm going to keep the metadata for secrets and config maps because that's the one I'm going to use as my example. And then we'll get rid of this as well. And then finally, we'll add a new rule at the bottom which will be level none. And that's all I'm going to put. And I'll explain that in just a second. I'm then going to change this namespace for learning. And I believe security learning was the other one. And I'm going to yank that line and put it on all the other ones. So what we're doing here is we're saying we want to do audit logging still, but we only want to target these two namespaces. So the same information will be coming out other than a few system authenticated bits that I've just deleted. But the fact is we don't want it from every namespace because I'm not interested in it. Later down the line, I could add other namespaces to this. I could add more rules. I could adjust some of these rules. I could do what I want, really. You know, there's a lot of tweaking we can do around this. But for now, all I really want to know about is if someone's changing secrets and config maps and if anyone's doing anything to the pods. They're the two things I really care about right now. So once a rule is matched, it essentially stops. So if it hits this point and it's matched, brilliant, that's what's logged. However, if none of this is matched, then it will get to this point, which is the metadata logging for anything else that is not in the stage request received inside the namespace learning and security learning. If anything else comes through, so any metadata, any request, any request response comes through and it's not in these two namespaces, it will hit this rule here, which is not, and that will just get dropped. We won't even log anything from that. So this should slow down what's coming out in the audit log. So I'm going to write that out and it won't just get reloaded because the cube API server is already running and it has already mounted that particular policy. So I'll need to reload those API servers. So I'm going to come out of here and actually I've just realized I only did that on one node. So I'll quickly grab that. Let's cat out ETC, Kubernetes, audit policy, and I'll just copy and paste these into the other nodes because I should have just done it on a sync pane, but I didn't. So we've got all three policies in place now. All we need to do is cry CTL, PS hyphen A, and then we just need to restart those API server pods. We could do it via kubectl, but since I'm on the nodes, I might as well just do them on here. So I'll do cry CTL stop that ID, so cry CTL stop that, and cry CTL, I want to remove that too. So we'll do that. Now I'll just grab that command and we will jump over to one of the other ones. So change the IDs for this one, cube API server. And then one last time, we will do it over here. Jump over to this one, okay. So now if we do that watch command again, we should see some new API servers coming in. Now the attempt will have increased by one because I've just killed the container and the new one will have come in. So it will see it as a new attempt, but it isn't rebooting. You can see here, this has been running 56 seconds, 40 seconds and 14, because I've only just done that one. So now we should see a lot calmer logs. So let's tail those logs again. Let's start a few new lines. And you can see there's nothing happening now. It's really quiet. So let's go ahead and create a secret. So I'm gonna do kubectl, create secret, generic, here is my secret. And then we will do in the namespace learning and from literal, and that will be test equals test. So if we press enter on that, that's created. Let's go and look at the audit log. If we go over here, we can see it hit control plane zero. And then let's have a look to see what actually happened here. So we had two events. The first one was from the source IP, IPv6. It was checking the resource quotas to make sure we were allowed to create a secret. And then afterwards it created a secret. And that secret was called, here is my secret. It came from my IP address. And we can see that I did it as Kubernetes admin rather than my Drew user, because why not? And the verb was create. We can see the audit ID. So we've got a specific ID we can target that with. It was of level metadata. And that was it, that was good. That worked for us, it did what we wanted it to do. Let's have a look to see what else we can do. So let's just drop a few new lines in again and we'll create a pod instead. So I'm going to press enter on that. That'll create a new pod. Let's go and check the audit logs. It hit control plane zero again. Let's scroll up and we can see now there's a lot more audit logging going on here. So let's scroll all the way up and there's a lot. You can see already there's a lot. This is all about metadata, the request and the response. So we have the metadata first, which was checking limit ranges. We then had another one checking the resource quotas. We then went along and found that we had a pod being created. So the request 
first response was create and it came from IRP. It was pods in the namespace learning called testing audits. And if we scroll down a bit further, we can start to see things about what I actually provided here. Look, we can see they've got containers, we've got testing audits, we can see the image, the commands. You can see quite a lot of information here. And then we have the response objects. So we can see what was actually created. This is the YAML that was passed through or the JSON actually to the API server that allowed it to be created. And yeah, that's it. Look, there's a lot of information in here. This is all to do with just creating a pod. Remember, this is the metadata the request object and the response object. So yeah, that's a lot of audit log information. But even that was just creating a single pod. You can see why you don't want to do it across the entire cluster now, because you might not need certain information. But if I've got a team working in namespace app A, I might want to log what's going on over there. Because if that's my production app, this could be vital when it comes to seeing who changed what, when it was changed, why it was changed. You know, it's just, it's important. And that is where I'm going to leave it. So that's it. That's everything for now on audit login. Next, we're going to take a look at termination handlers. I was going to do OIDC auth. For the person who asked me about OIDC auth, I'm not going to abandon it. I promise I will do it. But what I realized is there's going to be an expectation that you know about OIDC servers. So you either know how to set one up or you have one available. Since I'm presuming everyone watching this series is not an expert in these things, that was the whole point of me doing these, or doesn't have access to something like Okta, for example, I'm going to just postpone that a little bit. Because what I want to do first is finish this series as CKA and CKS. That, that was kind of the point of it. So I want to cover all the core Kubernetes stuff. Since OIDC isn't part of it, I'm going to move it into the next series. And I hope that's okay. I know you asked for it and I know I promised it and it will still come. It's just going to be a little bit later. The reason I'm doing that though, the reason behind it is because I do want to do a video on how to set up DEX and DEX can be used for OIDC or either that or authentic or ORI or something like that. O-R-Y, ORI, I don't know how it's pronounced, one or the other. Either way, I want to make sure that you've got all the tools available. I don't want to just go, oh, you've probably got an OIDC server somewhere. So here's how you set it up. Because if I start telling you about static clients or anything else to do with OIDC that might be required, you might then not know and then not be able to follow along. So I want to make sure you've got everything available to you to be able to follow along properly. So that's kind of to that one person who asked that that little bit there was just for you. So yeah, next we're going to do termination handlers. We'll then cover things like readiness probes, liveness probes, startup probes, and then we've got a couple of other videos I think in the pipeline without looking I can't remember what they are so I guess I'll just see you in that next video.